Good morning. This is Gardner Israel. I am going to do a review this morning of this bow. This is a very, you can tell, that's a pretty thing there. It's a takedown bow. Unscrew it. Take the limbs off. This is called a Southwest Archery Spider Bow. This one right here is, uh, uh, here's, right there is where it, And this guy here is uh, 62 inches and it's 30, looks like it's 35 pounds. I came into the possession of this yesterday from a friend of mine who has bought it, shot it just once or twice and has a shoulder injury and probably never will shoot a bow again. Didn't shoot it much before the shoulder injury. I have shot this bow. Oh. You can get these on Amazon. We looked it up. For about $150, 159 something like that. It's not a very expensive bow. It's a nice little bow. It has stabilizer um, insert where you can screw stabilizers in. It's got some brass inserts back here. I don't know what that's for. I guess for um, screwing on a quiver. It's got a hole that goes all the way through and comes out through the arrow rest right here. It might, might be for a plunger. I shot the bow I've been shooting bows a long time. In fact, I have a Black Widow uh, Olympic style target bow. One of the highest end bows around. This bow is ver a very nice little bow. If you have your arrow set up, uh, you're not going to be dis disappointed in unless you're really into the really expensive stuff. This is a good little bow and arrow. And I read on the internet that it goes from the lower end, 30 pound draw weights, right up to 60. And they come in varying lengths too. I guess the 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 more the higher poundage bows are going to be a little bit longer. And I did, I was curious about this. How in the world, where did these guys come from and how are they able to make this for $159? comes with a carrying case also. Uh, Swing back there, Deb, and look at the, the case. Now that, those are some arrows that the lady bought that uh, stuck a bunch of arrows in there. That's not the arrows that go with it, but that will hold the uh, yeah that will hold the uh, bow when it's taken down. Nice little case. Okay. My question was how how are they doing this? It says nowhere on here where it's made. But I suspected that it was made in China because uh, labor is cheap over there and not throwing off on Chinese. They, they make good stuff. They'll make anything you tell them to make and they'll make the quality you want. It's a nice little bow right here. So I looked up Southwest Archery and I, it took us a while to get to the bottom of it. The bow is made in China. But it doesn't say it very up front. It's not written it on anywhere. And it's American company, it says, uh, in Southwest Archery. Okay, I think they're trying to hide that fact by not coming straight out with it. And we had to look, you know, mess around for a little while before we found out that the, the bow was made in China. Okay, I'm not saying that's wrong, and I'm not saying you shouldn't get it because of that. Who knows who owns the company? It's in the company headquarters is in the United States, but you have no idea. And it doesn't really matter either. This is a, it's a free world, you know. And uh, so I'm not going to say don't buy this because it's made in China. In fact, I would say if you're on a limited budget, 
and you want to get into uh, archery with a good bow, a good little starter bow, or this is a good hunting bow right here. I'm not afraid of this bow at all. Uh, uh, I didn't pay but $50 for it, but uh, you can buy a brand new one for $159 with the case and everything. And I got the case and everything comes with it. Uh, everything you need, a bow stringer, um, and, and the accessories if you want to put a sight on it or if you want to put a stabilizer on it, it does come with a good string. So I'm saying go for it. I like this little bow. Uh, it's not heavy enough in Georgia to legally hunt with, but uh, it's not but 35 pounds, but I'll tell you this, after shooting some little bamboo arrows that I had, that I made up, that were nearer the, the weight that this should shoot, I wouldn't be a bit scared to shoot a deer with this bow right here if you had a properly tuned arrow and a good broadhead. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that this would kill a deer. 35 is, is uh, enough. Okay. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about another subject, in a way, and uh, now that I've got you watching about this boat, and I'll be right back to you. Okay, I'm back. I want to talk to you about what I consider to be for the believer. The one that is a believer in Christ. But you're not moving along in uh, spiritual development in a satisfactory way. You would like to have more. Maybe you're thinking, you know, you, is this all there is to it? You know, I'm still having a lot of problems and maybe worried too much or something like that. Well, I can tell you that Yeshua, Jesus, advised his disciples and us not to be worried. Don't worry. So, uh, but yet we're still doing it too much. We find ourselves worrying a lot. Well, I don't think he would have told us not to be worried if there were not a way to to do that. I mean, you can just tell yourself not worry, but that's not going to get it done sometimes. Don't worry. There's a saying that a lot of people know, let go and let God. That's a pretty good saying uh, as far as how you're going to not worry. But still, how is it done? Okay. Is God worried? Is Yeshua worried? No. I wouldn't think so. So if we have their spirit, then we're going to come closer to not being worried than if we don't have their spirit, or if we had their spirit a little bit and then don't have it now. And I talked to a friend yesterday and asked him about the Holy Spirit. Did he have it? Did he feel like he had it? And he said, it comes and goes. I thought that was a very accurate answer. It comes and goes. Alright, I'm going to start with the how, try to tie this together for you. The parable of the wise and foolish virgins. And I'm just going to read it and a couple of times while I'm reading it I might interject something to explain who's talking and what all that. Stay with me. I'm going to, this is going to be worth it because you're going to be able to move possibly exponentially forward in your Christian journey. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took 
their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. This is going to require a little bit of explanation. In the Jewish wedding ritual, the bridegroom came to the home of the bride, the future bride, and the marriage was arranged. Then the bridegroom left to go prepare a house. It was not known how long this would take. Well, this was the engagement. The bride then would spend her time getting ready, just like brides do now. They try to lose weight. They get their uh, clothing up. They definitely don't go out juking. You know what juking is? They don't do that. Because, you know, they're trying to be a pristine bride for their marriage. Okay? Bridegroom's gone. So that's what this is. The bridegroom had already left and now he's coming back. You don't know, by the way. That's another part of it. He doesn't say I'm coming back on the 13th or whatever. You don't know when he's coming back. This is analogous, this story, to Jesus. He's gone away. He's already come to visit and arrange the marriage. Well, the marriage is to the church. It's to all of us. And so, we don't want to be going out joking. And we want to be getting ourselves in good shape, spiritually, mentally. And it wouldn't hurt to you know, be in good physical shape too because the better to serve the kingdom if you're able to get up and move around a little bit. You don't know when he's coming back. The bridegroom's going to come back in an hour when you don't know. So if you're out doing something wrong, you're probably going to get caught. Okay? That's this Jewish wedding ceremony. That's how they do it still. He goes off to prepare a place. You remember what Jesus said? I go to prepare a place in my Father's house or many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Well, that's what he did. He came. That's when he came to earth. And now he's gone to prepare a place and he's going to come back. Okay? So, that's a little background of what this story is talking about. Then, all those virgins across... And then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. That's a picture of Yeshua coming back. Gets all of the people that belong to him, and they go, and the door is shut. Okay, what is that? Wherever he takes us, to heaven, I guess, whatever. There's all kind of theories on that. The door is shut. The ones that were not ready had to go try to get ready real quick and they couldn't get ready. They hadn't been preparing themselves like the bride 
would prepare herself like an earthly bride would try to get in good shape, um, lose weight, um, knit some socks or whatever, be caught, be caught at home behaving in, in the earthly sense. Not be caught out running around doing something, you know, oh, I don't, he, he won't be back too soon, you know. I'm not sure I want to be married to this guy, you know, that, you know, might be somebody better out there. Well, that, you see the picture there. So now, afterward, other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open up to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Okay. So this story talks about oil in lamps. Okay, what is the oil? So what is it that we need to have and we need to have extra, plenty of it for when the bridegroom comes back? And that would be Yeshua, Jesus, comes back. What is the oil? Now I had this problem a while back, I kept reading this. I said, well, what's this oil? What's this oil? Okay. I do now know what the oil is. I studied it, and I asked people, and it's a well-known thing for people that, you know, really study the Bible. And the oil is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the oil. Back then it would have been olive oil. I'll tell you, when they anointed the kings of Israel, the ritual was to pour oil over their head. And that oil ran down and ran down their beards. They had long beards and that oil would drip. That was a representation of the Holy Spirit. So that they were saying, I hope that this king will have the Holy Spirit and be a wise king. Now, pouring oil over your head will do nothing to get you the Holy Spirit. That's only a representation of the Holy Spirit. It only will get your beard greasy and your head. Okay? You can jump in a vat of oil and swim around, and it's not going to make you have the Holy Spirit. Okay? It represents the Holy Spirit. So, how do we do it? Alright, I'm going to turn to another place in the Bible, and I'm going to show you how we get the Holy Spirit. Well, I can tell you right now how we don't get it. Go ahead and tell you. You don't get it by good works. I don't care how much money you give to your church. I don't, I don't care how much money you send to St. Jude's. I don't care how many people on the street you give a dollar to when they're out there with a sign saying, I'm hungry. I don't care what you do. You cannot get the Holy Spirit with good works. Okay? So how do you get it? Now, good works are good. It's fine to do those things. You're also instructed to do that. You know, you're, you're instructed to be... Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So if you see a guy standing out there without any food, well, and you've got money, yeah, you, you should give him some. I have seen some people say, okay, I'll give you something to eat because they figure they're going to take that money and buy a bottle of wine. That might be a more, a better way to do it. Or you can just take their word for it that they need some money and give it to them if you have it. That's not going to get you the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to turn over here and read you Luke 11, 5 through 8. This is kind of long and drawn out, but this is extremely important. It may have eternal consequences for you. A friend came at midnight, is the title of it. 
And he said to them, he being Yeshua, he said to them, the people he was preaching to, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give you any bread. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So he's saying that this guy's not wanting to get out of bed and not wanting to open his house up and give this guy a couple of loaves of bread. He's already gone to bed. They're all in bed. They're in their night clothes. But his friend didn't go away. He just kept knocking and saying, Man, I'm in trouble. I got a friend here. I got to have some, I got to have this. I need it. Now, in the. <laughs> In this situation, the, the people understood what Jesus was saying because in this oriental culture, you were expected to treat visitors when they came into your house to treat them well. And the visitor had come from a long way and he needed something to eat. And if you didn't give them something to eat and something to drink, it was like being a very rude host. So this guy's going to, the moral of this is that this guy keeps knocking and the guy's going to finally give in. Now, the next one is titled, Keep Asking, Seeking, Knocking. I'll get to the part about the Holy Spirit and the oil, okay? So just hang with me. So I say to you, and it will be, oh, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who asked him? I'm going to read that one again. How much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He didn't say give you a new car, give you money, give you whatever you might want. He said give the Holy Spirit. Very specific. So, the Holy Spirit is the oil in the lamps. Okay. So how do you get the Holy Spirit? Ask, seek, and knock. And the little story above that emphasizes that you're going to keep knocking and asking and seeking. You're not going to ask one time. So that may be why my friend didn't understand. He said, yeah, it comes and goes. The Holy Spirit comes and goes. I feel like I have it sometimes. Well, my reading of this says that you're needing to be asking God to give you the Holy Spirit all the time, 24-7, knocking on that door. Now, God's not in bed with His children. That's, this, is, this part's an analogy, likening it to an earthly situation so you'll understand it. But He does want us to ask. He wants us to say, God, I want this more. I want more of this. I'm ready. I like the feeling of having the Holy Spirit 
the calmness of it, the clarity of thinking that comes with it. When I have the Holy Spirit, I can understand things. I can tell people about the Bible better when I have the Holy Spirit. And I want to be able to go with you when you come to get your bride. I don't want to be one of those that has limited oil or no oil and has to go and buy oil while he's rounding up his people and then when I get back he says the door is closed I never knew you okay the Holy Spirit okay there's another place where it says seek the kingdom of God and all things will be added to you now this is going to be controversial what I'm going to tell you right now I think this means don't ask for anything but the Holy Spirit. You're behind on your rent. You, the, the normal thing is you're going to say, God, I need money to pay my rent. Well, there's another place where it says, God knows what you need. Now, doesn't that make sense? He knows you don't have money to pay your rent. He's God. He knows everything. So I'm saying instead of asking God for money to pay your rent, why would you ask him? He already knows you, you owe money. But we do that because we don't understand what's going on. Seek the kingdom of heaven and all things will be added. All things that you need, by the way, not that you want. All things that you need. Okay, God, I need a fancy new car. No, you don't. He knows what you have need of. You need to fix the car you got. Maybe you need a new set of tires instead of a whole new car. Maybe you need the carburetor clean. He knows what you have need of. What do you really have? What do you really need? You need the Holy Spirit. See, if you have the Holy Spirit, then you're going to understand that you don't need a new car. If you have the Holy Spirit, you're going to realize that the reason you don't have any rent money is because you spend it going out to dinner three times a week instead of sitting at the house and cooking your own food and growing your own garden. Doesn't mean you can't ever go out to eat. It just means that when you have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will teach you how to manage your money. Maybe you're living in too fancy of an apartment that you can't afford on the job that you have. Okay, the Holy Spirit will teach you how to get the things that you need or manage the things that you already have. So this is the controversial part. I know a lot of churches teach, ask God for what you want. I want this, I want that. He knows what you need. You don't need that. You need the Holy Spirit and then you'll know how to manage your life. Okay, that's my, that's my take on it. So I advise you to quit asking for what you need physically in the world and start asking for what you need spiritually, which is the oil, which is called the Holy Spirit. What does it mean? What is the Spirit? Whose Spirit is that? That's God's Spirit that you're asking for. He promised that He would come into your heart and His Spirit would come into you. That's why... Jesus said that he will become one with us. His spirit would come into us. And then we'll be able to manage our lives. We'll be able to be do that thing I talked about, not to worry more. I'm not going to say you're never going to worry. But instead of saying, God, I don't want to worry. Help me, help me get that thought out of my mind. It's good. I just keep worrying. I keep worrying. No, he knows you're having that thought. Ask him for the Holy Spirit. When you get the Holy Spirit inside you, then you're not going to worry. The Holy Spirit is not worried. If His Spirit is in you, then you're not going to worry. You're going to say, God knows what He's doing. I'm in this situation. I'm in this situation because God's got me there. Or either I got myself there by not doing right. And I'm not going to worry anymore. That's the Holy Spirit. But when your Spirit takes over, you're going to start worrying again. All right, this is Gardner Israel. I hope that helped you.
ask. Try me out on that. Try, try me on that. Quit asking for a new car. Quit asking for all that stuff. Start asking for the Holy Spirit. Start begging. Asking, seeking, knocking. And try out and see if I'm not right. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep on asking, seeking. And I think that you will see all of a sudden your attitude is going to start to change. The way that you look at things are going to change. All right, this is Gardner Israel. I hope I'll get a chance to talk to you again. And I know I'll have something to say to you. How do I know? Because I'm asking and seeking and knocking. And if I have the Holy Spirit in me, I'm not going to have any lack of things to talk about that will help, hopefully, help you to understand the Bible. Okay, talk to you soon, God willing.